And also, so now we continue the program uh, with the state of the API economy, right? And I would be glad to have uh, Vikas coming on stage. Yeah, Vikas, how are you? I'm good. Uh, how are you, maybe? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. And we really wait for this uh, state of the API economy. So I invite you also, Greg, to be on stage. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll share you. I'll let you share what you have with us, and uh, so we can have the question together. Well, you know, first of all, uh, thank you for having us here. And I know there are many sessions happening in parallel. So uh, thank you and appreciate all the listeners listening to us. Well, we do have a surprise for you. So <laughs> instead of talking about state of the economy, we're going to talk about drawing parallels between APIs and event streams. So that's a little bit of a rabbit out of the hat, if you will. Uh, you know, uh, APIs help you be more dynamic and change. And this is a great example for that. So uh, my name is Vikas Anand. I'm a head of product for Apigee at Google. And uh, joining me today is Greg. Greg, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm, I'm Greg Braille. I work on the Apigee team. I uh, lead the architecture of the Apigee products and have done that for a very long time. Thank you, Greg. And uh, I think before we kick this off, uh, it's probably a good idea just to have a, a, you know, maybe an icebreaker, something which we want our listener to think about since they can't interact with us uh, at the moment, but maybe they can uh, respond on the chat or uh, in a, as a question. What you know, APIs have become so pervasive, we just wake up to it and use it implicitly nowadays in our life. Uh, Greg, what was the first API that you used today morning? Today morning? Oh, OK. I thought you meant ever. That was harder. Um, I have one of those Google alarm clocks. So um, I happen to know that when it rings the alarm and I say stop, which is my wife and I roll up around in bed a lot and yell stop at the Google alarm clock, um, it's using a Google Assistant API. Um, to uh, do the voice translation. Apparently, it understands the word stop pretty well, and then it stops the alarm, which we discovered once didn't happen when the Wi-Fi wasn't working. So we're going to have to work on that next, but what, one step at a time. No, that's pretty cool. Uh, for me, uh, I woke up to the weather API, and then, of course, I was looking at the stock tracker. So there was a stock API, mm -hmm. which was serving up these stocks after that. So I'm sure all of you as a listener uh, to the session have your favorite APIs, which you wake up to. I uh, would love to know about that uh, as a follow-up uh, so, you know, whenever uh, you want to post or, or, or is it during the Q&A. Uh, so let's talk about our session today. So if you go to the next slide, please. The key takeaways that we want you to have from our session today are really two things. Uh, we, you know, we've always been talking about APIs for many years now. Apigee is a market leader in the API management space. APIs are pervasive. And we really know how to manage APIs as a part of our platform. I mean, a market leader. Uh, but we wanted to talk about the synergy between events, uh, event streams, and APIs in this session. And the key takeaways we want you to have from today's session is events are becoming more mainstream, and they're here to stay. And the second is, as they become more pervasive and proliferate, they need to be managed. And we believe that the management has to be the same way as you manage your APIs in your ecosystem. So let's go to the next slide. And what I'll try to do is set up a few things from a context perspective. And then, uh, of course, we'll describe what events are after that. So um, you know, I think, as all of you are aware, uh, digital transformation has been top of the mind from a business imperative perspective. In fact, I was listening to the pre previous uh, speaker as well from, uh, uh, from the uh, enterprise space. And they were talking about how the uh, uh, the, the line of business is actually funding a number of uh, API initiatives uh, as a part of the business imperative. So whether you, it's an enterprise, whether it's a, a SMB, there is, there is definitely a focus on driving digital transformation. What we've seen through the last year is that this is accelerated beyond imagination. So if you look at some of the key metrics here, uh, through the pandemic, online shopping uh, increased by 22%. Uh, Forty-six percent of consumers are now using telehealth to replace, you know, cancelled health visits, uh, visits, if you will. And uh, if you look at even the currency uh, transactions, uh, there's a thirty-one percent rise in digital payments, with fifty-seven percent uh, in terms of fall of cash usage. So, the pandemic, ha pandemic has, you know, accelerated the uh, adoption of digital channels, uh, which means obviously. Uh, there's a lot of uh, focus on uh, 
uh, embracing APIs and you know APIs which used to be the agents of change between systems are now really driving the business critical and differentiated use cases of enabling omnichannel use cases, touchless payments, virtual experiences, open banking, etc. In fact, uh, our state of the economy report, which was you know the original title of the session, uh, we uh, uncovered that more than fifty percent of uh, uh, the uh, people we surveyed uh, said that APIs help them to build better digital experiences and accelerate innovation. So, uh, you know, this is the acceleration which is happening. Uh, let me talk a little bit about what's also happening in the in, in parallel in terms of systems uh, and technologies which are actually help drive this digital experience. So, if you go to the next slide, uh, what I'll use this slide for is to actually explain a little bit about the pervasiveness of event streams as well. So uh, here I've taken an example, uh, actually I've taken a few examples across different verticals uh, to illustrate you know, different type of event streams uh, from a business process perspective, right? Uh, I think uh, Greg uh, talked about his API that he used in the morning, which was uh, the alarm clock. Uh, uh, for me, it was, you know, weather as well as the stock. So if you look at the banking and financial space, uh, you know, stock ticker has been a traditionally well-known pattern of something which is streamed. You need to be having a regular update on how stocks are behaving as you make decisions in terms of uh, acquiring stock or selling stock. Uh, in, you know, in the case of retail, uh, you know, uh, event streams uh, are really uh, around many different use cases. Some of them could be from logistics providers, some of those could be around inventory. Uh, in fact, also looking at how events can be uh, used for more actionable insight to personalize the experience for the buyers. Uh, in terms of telecom, you know, geolocation, uh, and of course, uh, looking at uh, billing and other aspects around the business uh, also involve a number of events. And we are seeing this as a pervasive thing across uh, various industries. Uh, so what, you know, how does event act streams actually help uh, from a business perspective and a technology perspective? So if you go to the next slide, I think there are three things which are most important. Uh, one is events actually help you to have flexibility to react and, you know, respond to user actions. So there's, uh, you know, uh, example of retail, right, where you are listening to events uh, which are, uh, you know, giving providing the changes which are happening based on inventory or, uh, or or clicks which a user is making looking at an application which is uh, providing information about products, uh, there is a flexibility to quickly react to those user reactions. Uh, second is uh, event streams are also becoming a part of the overall solution, uh, which is really helping uh, deliver a connected uh, digital uh, engagement. And finally, helping in, 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 in personalized experience as well for the type of users that uh, the application of the technology or the business is trying to serve. So I think that is a, a, a good way to set the context in terms of the business and the key trends. What we would like to do in the next few minutes is Greg and I will talk through, uh, kind of walking through the foundational elements uh, of you know, events as well as how events and APIs are coming together. So uh, Greg, why don't we start with that next? Absolutely. We're going to talk a little bit about event streams and kind of, you know, and we will get to why are we talking about event streams at an API conference? I think that's probably the main question you have. Um, so event streams, um, actually nothing all that new. I thought I thought Fakasa was going to ask me the first API I ever used, and I had to be like, it was probably print on the Apple II, Apple Soft Basic. Um, actually, mine didn't have the soft part. It just was integer basic. There we go. Thanks, Steve Wozniak, for that. But event streams, um, we've had published and subscribed systems for many decades in the industry, which are very good at sending events to a large number of workstations. The big killer app for pub sub systems in my career was Trading Floors. All the Wall Street traders sitting there need to know within a couple of uh, milliseconds um, when something changed so they can make trades. That's where pub sub systems came for. We had message queuing systems for a long time. I think what really broke open event streaming in the more mainstream enterprise context was when Kafka came along because the Kafka software, originally from LinkedIn, now Confluent, um, makes it 
easier to have a globally scalable, highly reliable, high volume stream of events in an enterprise. And these make it possible for you to distribute events. And we have stock prices as an example here, but you could see customer loan applications, um, new customer signups, um, new support tickets, uh, systems events, such as uh, alerts being raised. And all of these systems are basically very, very good at taking a large number of state changes, turning them into messages and putting them on a stream. And consumers can then read the stream. In the case of Kafka, they can read the stream right away. They can actually go back and historically read the stream. Um, and this makes it a, a, basically a very flexible way to distribute in, information to a lot of different endpoints. And it's also possible with event streaming and message queuing systems before it to do that reliably. So if you're consuming that stream of new loan applications and you have to take a system down for maintenance, or if the system can't process, um, if there are a lot of uh, peaks in, in the, in the uh, transaction volume, Perhaps you get hundreds of applications per second in the beginning of the day, and you have long periods at night when nothing is coming in. If your backend can't handle those hundreds of transactions a second, it can consume the event stream at a more measured pace, and it allows you to make your whole system more responsive. These are things we've traditionally used event streams for, and Vakas gave a lot of examples about how they're being used today. So if we compare them to APIs, obviously they're synchronous versus asynchronous. Um, meaning that users of APIs typically expect to send a request and get back a meaningful response. And users of event streams typically expect to send a request and get back simply an acknowledgement that the, the event has been published to the stream and then separately expect to consume streams. And if they need to respond, they typically do it by publishing a message to another event stream. Um, so these are, you know, big changes in paradigm and they, they lead to different kinds of application architectures. We use APIs when we want to respond immediately to a user. We use event streams when we want something to be processed later or we want to hand it off to a lot of different systems. Sometimes we also do use event streams to pass large volumes of things. I'm sure Vacasa's stock trading app probably has a, a web socket or something that's probably consuming an event stream from somewhere on the internet so he can react instantly to changes in, in Tesla stock. Um, but, that's, uh, but that's neither here nor there. Um, Protocol-wise, APIs are all about HTTP. I have given presentations in the past that said the basis of APIs was HTTP, JSON, OAuth, and TLS. GraphQL, gRPC, these are, are new, a, new technologies that build on the API stack that people are using all over the place. They also use HTTP. Event streams are optimized for pushing large amounts of data out to consumers and having them consume them efficiently. So Kafka has its own protocol, but there are also standard protocols like AMQP, MQTT, um, Stomp's a little older. Um, so there are a number of different protocols, but that becomes an important part of the event stream. So just like you know, it's not an API if it's not HTTP for the most part. Um, for an event stream, someone consuming an event streaming system is going to expect to consume it using one of those protocols. So, so Greg, uh, sorry, before we yeah, go to the next problem. slide, I think, uh, yeah. yeah, on the previous slide, I think uh, for our listeners, it may be just important for you to, uh, you know, a lot of times people ask about, do the same SLAs apply, whether it's APIs or event streams uh, from a, you know, as you're building your architecture. And the second thing is, I think, you know, async API uh, is something which has come up. So perhaps you may want to just distinguish what it means in the context of, you know, uh, APIs and event streams. Yeah, and I think this is actually kind of where we're getting. Um, certainly, you know, the SLA for an API is typically, you know, availability. What, what percentage of the time can I expect to success? And latency, how quickly can I expect a response? Uh, with event streams, you're typically expecting a low latency. If you publish to a message, you expect to get back an acknowledgement right away saying, we got it. And the SLA has to include some sort of durability. You don't ever want your event streaming system to lose your message. So systems like Kafka have been built up with a lot of replication and a lot of redundancy. And this is what I spent a lot of my career on before APIs, um, making sure that transactional message queues, you know, if you turned off the power on the system running your BEA WebLogic server in 1999, we wanted to make sure that when you turned it back on again, all of your messages and transactions would be exactly the same state you left them on. And a lot of people worked very hard on that, right? Um, but when it comes to describing event streams in the API world, we all know and have, you know, for the most part, we have open API. And that's typically what we use in the API world to describe the shape of an API. 
In the event streaming world, the emerging standard is async API. It has a lot of similarities. In fact, I'm sure some of you on this call probably have worked on async API and could probably talk more about it than I do. But the interesting thing about it is that it's very similar to open API. It's YAML based, love it or hate it. It's sort of the, you know, the worst of all formatting systems except for all the others. And the advantage of async API is that now you have a document that can describe an event stream and can even allow clients to generate code to produce or consume to that event stream for different event streaming systems. And that description is actually can be independent of protocol. So my understanding is you can write an async API a doc that describes an event stream that can be implemented on Kafka or AMQP or, or MQ series or, 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 or you name it. So that's a pretty interesting, interesting development there. So that's one way. So now we start thinking about APIs and event streams. And when we think about APIs, now we often talk about how, I'm gonna go back up one actually. Um, we often talk about APIs and in, in sort of outside of the API community, when people think of APIs, they think of public APIs. They think of you know building your own Twitter API. Within the API community, we know that the vast majority of APIs are used internally. They're used inside large corporations that have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of APIs that are used to run their business. We also know that uh, people often use APIs to create links to partners and customers and for business to business purposes. The event streaming world, my understanding is that it seems to skew a lot more towards those internal event streams. So just as in, I, there are certainly cases where there are people out there who might be publishing data over an event stream to the internet, you know, maybe in the case of like a stock feed or something. But most of the use cases for event streams we see are companies that have a large number of event streams and they're asking questions like, as an event stream producer, how do I understand who is using, what applications are using my event stream? If I wanna make a change to the format an event of an event, which applications will it affect? Um, how do I authenticate people to my event stream? Um, does everyone have to, you know, have a, a, a token to get onto my, onto my Kafka system, or is there some more abstract way that I can do it? Um, how do I control usage? Um, perhaps I have an event stream that I want every, every development organization in my large multinational company to publish to. Do I want to have some sort of quota so that people don't publish an excessive number of messages or create an excessive number of subscriptions um, without talking to me first? Um, perhaps I want to monetize my event stream. I want to have an internal chargeback. Um, basically, these are all the same questions we asked about APIs five or 10 years ago. And I think that, and I know I want to, we want to leave a few minutes for questions and someone's, I think, getting ready to ask one here. Um, but I think one of the really interesting things to think about here, and this is sort of the central question is, just as we, the API management community, created a set of tools and technologies and processes and culture around how to create APIs and share them with consumers in a scalable way. We had, we need the same thing for event streams. So companies, API product managers, I think are increasingly likely, and in fact, I'm sure some of you are already doing it, are also event stream product managers. People who are internally responsible for publishing an API for consumption by hundreds or thousands of developers will probably be publishing event streams to be consumed by hundreds or thousands of developers. So how will those developers discover the event stream? How will they get access to the event stream? How will you, the publisher of the event stream, control who can use your event stream? Make sure that they don't abuse your event stream. Um, understand what the implications are if you want to deprecate or change the format of an event stream. These are all the exact same questions that people ask about APIs. Are there standards for the format of the messages on the event stream? Perhaps there's some sort of you know, event stream design standard. Um, are there security requirements for the event stream? Do you wanna make sure that everyone who produces to an event stream gets an OAuth token from the same authentication system that you use to get your OAuth tokens for APIs. I think that sort of the future of all this stuff is we're gonna to have to start increasingly thinking of APIs and event streams as being part of the same universe of things to be managed by an API management system. Um, and I think that's a very interesting thing to be looking at for the future. Um, and I have taken up way too long and probably talked way too fast, um, but I think we have a few minutes for questions, uh, and both Mehdi and Vikas will probably have lots of things to say. Yeah, thank you very much. We have a we have a four minute uh, uh, for questions. So the thing is, 
the let's say the event driven approach like has been like really conquering a lot of uh, uh, hearts and mind of of um, let's say people involved in APIs and architecture. But when would you advise to adopt this kind of architecture compared to traditional system, like in terms of use case, not just technical aspect, but in terms of business use cases? Um. I think to a large degree, people know it when they see it. Um, I, I think that the classic event streaming use cases are you're pushing a lot of data um, and you don't want to wait for the processing. You don't want to wait for the latency of the processing, right? Like we don't use in the world of infrastructure, we don't use, uh, you know, we may have a logging APIs, but when, when, a, when a system has to produce a log record, it doesn't wait for some logging system in some central data center somewhere to respond before it's done pushing the log record. It puts the log record on an event stream and it goes on with its life so that it doesn't add any additional latency. But there's this giant stream of log messages coming out of all of your systems that you then consume and analyze centrally. So that's one pretty obvious case in my opinion. And I think uh, just to add to what Greg said, if you just like take a step, like look at top down from a business perspective, from a digital value chain perspective, you know, if you are focusing on a business outcome uh, and really trying to put your data to work, uh, that, you know, those patterns uh, on the use cases would really define at which points, you know, you want to have the intervention with this events driving some of the changes, right? They could be changes which could drive some user action. They could be changes which could drive some system, you know, uh, actions, or they could be changes which are more business centric or application changes that you're trying to make. I mean, traditionally, uh, uh, event driven architectures have been very inward facing of within the organization, right? I think the opportunity by having a lens of APIs uh, on top of an event driven architecture is that there's an opportunity to bring this uh, even for external use cases. Right, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, is uh, something which, uh, as architects uh, uh, try to solve for business needs, uh, it actually opens up a door for them to bring it out uh, for the business use cases, and of course for their partners and developers to onboard and start using it. So you mentioned async KPI, but uh, today async KPI it is hard for async KPI team to. Uh, to follow all the potential protocols and you know specify all of yeah. them. So yeah, how today you would you would you would advise a company who wants to jump into event-driven architecture on top of a CKPI? Well, I mean, you do need to be able to describe the structure of your stream and describe the structure of your events in some standard way. So. I don't know how practical, you know, having using async API to generate event stubs is just like, you know, by the way, uh, generating clients from open API is possible, but it's not the reason why people get the value out of open API. They get the value because here's a document that describes our API, or here's a document that describes our event stream. And now everybody can very quickly see, and even you can put it in a source code management system and you can have pull requests on it and you can debate the format Hey, we'd like to add a field, you know, well, you know, that field is a string, but it should be a decimal. Um, you know, you didn't, you didn't get the name right. You know, there's another field just like it somewhere else in the message. I think that's the, been the biggest value of open API in the world um, of APIs. And I think for event streams, I think async API will provide something similar. Are, are you familiar with the concept of customer event driven architecture, really focusing on the action of a customer you know, to provision applications, like, and if, if, if not, what do you think? And if yes, uh, like, uh, 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 yeah, how, what, how would you see an implementation of it? I'm not sure if Vikas has an opinion, but that's not something I've encountered myself. Yeah, I'm trying to understand the question here. Uh, is it? In a previous it, conference, uh, if, I may, if I'm in a previous yeah. conference, someone was showing like, we should not treat events only in terms of architecture, you know, instead of polling, you know, but like in, we should also involve the customer actions as event and you should be customer action driven architecture, you know? So uh, yeah, mostly involving the business, involving yeah. the product into the architecture. I mean, if you could see, you know, as a business, you need an event stream that you can consume to follow the activities of your customers, that would be extremely valuable and scalable, I would think. 
Yeah, you know, I think that makes sense. I mean, that's what I was describing, you know, in your value chain, as you're trying to build your business outcome and solution. And as a part of that, if your focus is on your customer actions to make sure that you can personalize the outcome for them or ensure their success when using your platform, um, whether it's a retail use case. I mean, retail is a great example because you really want to follow the journey of your customer regardless of where their actions are. Their actions could be on your web page or they could, their actions could be in the store when they're physically in the store and trying to look at uh, you know things within the store. So uh, if you have the ability to actually uh, see through events, uh, the user actions which the customer is generating, then obviously you can react much better over there. So is polling dead or we still have a use case for polling APIs? Um, there certainly are people who are going to keep doing it because sometimes it's the only thing you have. Um, I think the, you know some of the there are some nice HTTP two capabilities as well. But I think you know I think we're talking about the last mile. You know how do I get you know stuff from the API thing in the internet to my device? I think what's behind that is probably going to be some sort of event streaming system because you need to know how do you manage subscriptions, how do you handle retries, um, all that sort of thing. And the last mile is, you know, maybe it was, you know, it was uh, Kafka or uh, something like that all inside my enterprise. And the last mile is going to use a WebSocket or an HTTP2 stream to push it to my device. Yeah, thank you. I think we covered all the questions. Plus, I, I did uh, one, of, one of mine. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank you, Vikas. OK. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much for having us. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Have a good